Hi folks, welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Vince Whitfield. Let's get started. So what do you know about NASA's Constellation program? For anyone who said nothing, let me fill you in. Right now, we use a space shuttle to get us to and from low Earth orbit. But that's just not going to work anymore. Since NASA plans on heading back to the moon and beyond, they're going to need something other than the space shuttle to accomplish such a task. Enter the Constellation program. Did you ever see what the Apollo missions looked like when they took off? Well, imagine that plus 40 some odd years of technology and you have the Constellation program. It's made up of three main parts. You have the Ares rocket, which is what will launch the crew and cargo into space. The lunar lander, which is responsible for transporting crew members to and from the moon's surface. And lastly, the Orion, which will house the crew as they travel from Earth, through space and to the moon. Since the Orion will be the housing for the next generation astronauts, it's crucial that we keep them safe. This means that there needs to be an escape plan in the highly unlikely event that something goes wrong during or before launch. This is the Delta rocket. It was carrying a satellite into space in 1997 when it exploded during its ascent. It's because of unforeseen instances like this that we need to have a backup plan for our astronauts as they travel to space. No worries though, NASA is already working on a backup plan and they call it the Launch Abort System. That's it right there. The Launch Abort System actually covers the Orion crew vehicle where the astronauts are. And there was a whole group of scientists and engineers devoted to keeping our future moonwalkers safe from harm. Imagine a rocket on its way to space when all of a sudden something goes wrong. Well, first and foremost, we need to get those astronauts out of there. The launch abort system will be initiated. The entire thing will completely lift away from the Ares rocket, one mile in the air and one mile downrange, spin around and be out of harm's way. The Orion crew vehicle will detach from the launch abort system, parachutes will deploy and astronauts will come in for a safe landing. It might sound easy, but engineers took a lot of time to figure this stuff out. My friend John Stadler can help explain this a little better. He's hanging out at the hangar at NASA Langley Research Center. When we do an abort, the first thing we have to do is fly away from the whatever happened to cause us to do an abort. So we fly in a forward direction to get away from that activity. But then we have to flip the LAS around 180 degrees. We then jettison away from the crew module so it can separate and deploy its parachute so it can float uh, safely back down to the ground. The launch abort system is actually what we call aerodynamically unstable. What that means, if you think of an arrow, you, you throw an arrow, it'll want to fly forward. If you take an arrow, you throw it backwards, feathers first, it actually wants to flip around. In that configuration, it's aerodynamically unstable. The launch abort system is actually very similar. It's aerodynamically unstable. It wants to naturally flip. So we actually have control rockets at the very tip of the, of the launch abort system that keep us pointing in a forward direction. So once we then get away from the, uh, the abort situation, we then just give it a small little kick over using our, our rockets at the tip of the motor to flip us around and we'll naturally want to fly in the heat shield forward condition or backward orientation. Now, watching the animation gives you an idea of how the launch support system will work. But think about this. Imagine how fast a rocket is going when it takes off. If the launch support system is initiated, it stands that the astronauts inside are going to have to get away a lot faster. Okay. So you know that any object with mass, like our sun for example, has a gravitational force on all other objects with mass. That includes all of us. The mass of objects and the distance between the objects affects this force. This pull is called a g-force. Now g-forces can change as the acceleration of an object changes. The higher the g-force, the more weight an object has. For instance, standing here right now, I am experiencing 1g. That's the amount of force that the Earth's gravity is pulling on me. Same thing you're feeling right now. You've all experienced changes in G-forces too. Ever been on a roller coaster? Riders on a roller coaster are experiencing forces near zero Gs at the top of a big loop. In other words, they feel almost weightless here. At the bottom of the same loop, riders feel a force four times their own weight. Really heavy. That's why it's so easy to lift your arms up at the top of ride and so hard to do so at the bottom. Think about swinging on the swing set. When do you feel light and when do you feel heavy? On the upward part of the swing, you feel lighter. On the downward swing, you would feel about two Gs, or twice as heavy as you really are. When you cough, three and a half Gs. When astronauts launch into space on the space shuttle, they feel three Gs of force being applied to them, but that's over an extended period of time. The quick change in G-forces one experiences is what causes that funny feeling in your stomach, like when you're flying down a steep decline at a roller coaster. 
That feeling is also why it's probably not such a good idea to eat lunch just before going on a ride. Two, three, four. This is the little leagues of G-forces in comparison to what astronauts would experience if the launch abort system is initiated. Like I said earlier, in the unlikely event that the launch abort system needs to be activated, astronauts would need to get very far, very fast in order to get away from any danger. Zero to 725 kilometers per hour in three seconds to be exact. How many G-forces do you think that equals? If you said eight, you're wrong. The answer is 11, 11 Gs. And although four Gs on a roller coaster is fun to some, 11 Gs is no walk in the park. Not only would you feel like you weighed 11 times more than you usually do, but you would barely be able to move. There's three things that affect how many Gs a human can tolerate. It's the direction of the Gs, the duration, and then your physical condition. The human body is actually most capable of experiencing Gs in what we call eyeballs in, or basically being pushed this direction. The analogy would be if you're sitting in a car at the red light and the light turns green, you accelerate the car very quickly, you get pushed back in the seat of the car. That's eyeballs in acceleration. That's the human body's most capable direction. And in that configuration, a, a well-conditioned astronaut can experience about 18 Gs and still be able to function. Uh, you know, being able to flip switches, actually control the spacecraft. Uh, the other direction where the humans are less tolerable are what we call eyeballs out, and that's just the opposite direction of the, the, the acceleration coming out of the chest. And the, the analogy would be in your car and you're braking really hard and you're kind of being pushed forward. In that type of situation, it's really tough on the eyes. It actually tries to pull the eyes out of your sockets. You'll get bloodshot eyes. It, it's pretty nasty. In that configuration, you will only be able to uh, operate around 10 to 12 Gs and still be able to control the vehicle. Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that the scientists and engineers who designed the launch abort system hope they never have to see their hard work put to use. Thanks for watching NASA Launchpad. Until next time, I'm Vince Whitfield. Catch you later.